But the mafia today is something else. The mafia today means that uh, yeah, a padrone from a family in the south sends their children to Bocconi in Milano to study finance because yes. it's finance where they have to be. Or you, yeah. you create a company that is um, recycling waste because they know that this is a super profitable business if you just mm -hmm. take the waste and instead of recycling it, you dump it somewhere. Mm -hmm. and companies pay a lot of money for the recycling. So you, you, you turn this into a business. So they are entrepreneurs. They, um, they, they, they build these companies. They manage the, the flow of the money to Switzerland, uh, to Swiss banks or banks in London. Hello, this is your host, Camila Hankiewicz. And together with my guests, we discuss how tech is changing the way we live and work. Ready? Guido. The more I was reading about your research and the work you are doing around mafia uh, and other organized crime and the legal um, organizations, the more I couldn't wait to, to uh, speak with you. It's a pleasure. It's, it's a pleasure to have you here. Thank you for having me, Camila. So let's start with the most daunting question. Why did you get involved in crime with <laughs> crime? <laughs> well, I... I studied management and philosophy, and then I discovered this interface between these two, which is business ethics. And this was in the late 90s. And, and uh, my research that I then developed when I was a PhD student was about the impact of globalization on governance, on democracy. And one of the things that was clearly visible in, in, in that period after the fall of the Berlin Wall was that there was an, a gap opening of governance. So companies were going global. But governments were remaining nationally bound. So you suddenly had all kinds of human rights violations in the supply chains of American European companies, like Nike and Levi's as the first ones who moved the production elsewhere. So my, my first entry point into yeah, the dark side of business, so to speak, was human rights violations in supply chains. And from there, I moved into other topics that uh, are connected. And you just wanted to discover part of your Italian <laughs> roots. It's not, it's like, you're not connected, I hope. But uh, yes, it's all, it's a, it's a very interesting behavioral phenomenon, how those organizations, uh, why do some organizations choose to commit, not maybe ethically, ethically um, and legally okay um, activities, and some others are trying to fight those or are trying to stand for something which is um, positive. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was, at that time, I don't think that this was all done by intention. I, I guess the companies mm -hmm. themselves were surprised by having those problems because we had this mindset of a company being responsible for what it does itself within mm -hmm. its legal limits. And that was before outsourcing was invented and outsourcing is a result yeah. of globalization. So when globalization made it possible, so the fall of the Berlin Wall made it possible to to, to outsource activities into places where uh, work uh, labor costs were lower, um, I guess no one no one thought about the side effect, which was that there were also compromises uh, to be made on on the rights of workers, on the conditions in factories, and mm -hmm. even if they knew about this, they probably didn't think that they were responsible. The first reaction of Nike when they were attacked in the early '90s was to say, "Well." Uh, yeah, we are sorry about these working conditions, but this is not Nike. We are uh, just uh, outsourcing something to someone else. So please contact that company and not us. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. They didn't want to take responsibility. Yes, they didn't take, want to take responsibility. And we have come a long yeah. way since then. So today it is taken for granted, at least, that we can hold the big brands responsible for whatever happens up and down their supply chains. So this has become a normal moral discourse. It did, but like you, you I've, I've watched your uh, TED Talks, I've watched your, the, um, I, I think it was like 10 years ago, from ESSEC uh, Business School, <laughs> your, um, it was amazing um, lecture. But like you say, it depends on where, if, if the, um, the party has interest in revealing it or, or hiding it, right? So, for example, it's still happening in... Um, companies which are util like I'm in an AI field and you know the big guys I don't want to name them but they are creating new type of sweatshops right like they are pay finding those 
poorly paid workers to uh, moderate uh, responses. Yes, I mean, sometimes I show my students the very first slides that I uh, constructed when I was starting to be a professor in Lausanne in mm -hmm. 2003. And mm -hmm. I showed them these slides and, and, and the content of these first sessions I was teaching. And it's the same stuff I could teach today. And that's sometimes yeah. a bit frustrating. The same problems, um, partly in the same industries, but as you mentioned, also in new industries mm -hmm. uh, come up again and again. And when the companies are caught, they're often surprised because, again, they didn't think about this. They just outsourced. They saw the cost advantage and they didn't think about the side effects. And there's an amazingly flat learning curve among companies when it comes to um, human rights. Mm -hmm. But it's also about um, distributed um, responsibility, right? Like it's yes. not me, it's, it's, it's them or my boss uh, may know about that, but it's not, my, uh, it's not within my remit. Yes, it, it's, it's collective irresponsibility because you can always shift the blame to someone else. You can say, well, it's the consumers. Mm -hmm. Or it's the supplier who is cheating on me. Uh, I, I, didn't, yes. I, I go, gave them my code of conduct. Yeah, maybe you gave them the code of conduct, but you at the same time pressured them for the cheapest price so that they have to make a choice uh, either yeah. to to follow, to comply with the code of conduct or to comply with the procurement uh, expectations. So, but the more actors are involved in such networks of decision making, the more difficult it is to, to pinpoint the ones who are responsible because everyone is a bit responsible and, and every, if everyone is a bit responsible in the end no one is responsible mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah completely agree and uh, we've seen this across different the areas like politics as well yes so as you know <laughs> I, i'm proud of proud of my past uh, that i lived in italy i've visited uh i, I lived in uh, napoli uh, actually uh, benevento and, and napoli um for some bit I so I've seen almost all Italy. I've seen Sicilia. I've seen uh, Calabria, Messina, all those kind of areas which are known for other things uh, than uh, food as well and and hospitality. It was a co coincidence. It was before I started reading about your research. But only yesterday uh, morning, I've uh, seen the information about uh, Adio Pizza. Mm -hmm. I, I've never heard of of this uh, organization organization before. And it was, it was like shocking. Then I, I checked, I, I saw your um, lecture and you were talking about Adia Pizza. And um, it was shocking to me that 90% of Sicilians, Sicilian, Sicilian uh, entrepreneurs were like, they had to pay protection money. Um, and there were, it was just ingrained in the culture, right? It was like mm -hmm. for 150 years but from what you were saying. And those seven uh, students decided to challenge that. And it was just so incredible how those small, this small group of people, they did, like you said, like they didn't have anything to lose. So they d decided to play by the same rules, but the opposite. Yes. I mean, change it. Next, next to crimes done by organizations, there is criminal organizations. And mm -hmm. Italy is is hit by this since, uh, as you said, more than one hundred and fifty years by the by the mafia organizations, and for many Italians, this is this has become a kind of a objective natural law. So you cannot mm -hmm. get rid of this. It's it's like this. We have to live with it. And the story that you uh, refer to, the story of Adio Pizza, is a story of of, of seven young people who refused to accept this refused mm -hmm. to assume that paying protection money to the mafia as shop owners or companies in Sicily and not only in Sicily uh, are doing, that this is a natural law and you cannot escape this. So they created an, an initiative against it, um, Adio Pizzo. Uh, so farewell protection money, Pizzo is the protection money. And they, and they, 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 they took a big risk because until then, whoever had resisted the protection mm -hmm. money would see his or her shop burned down or even mm -hmm. killed. Yes. So there have been entrepreneurs who have been killed who refused to pay. And then, and these seven young students they knew about these risks, so they they developed a clever strategy. They co convinced, I guess, more than a hundred shops downtown Palermo to commit to not paying the pizza anymore. 
And then they convinced a few thousand customers um, to go and shop, especially in those shops. Because the, the first thing the mafia does is it isolates you. Mm -hmm. um, this is also happening with all these judges who have been killed. You, you're isolated. Mm -hmm. And when you're isolated, it's easier to kill you. So these shops that did not pay the pizza in the past, they were often isolated. So no, no customers were going there anymore. Um, police were not protecting them. So they, why would they do this? But this move of the of these seven young people was very clever because the mafia cannot at the same time threaten a hundred or more shop owners in the same area. So it, it overwhelmed mm -hmm. the protection possibilities of the mafia and that's how they made it work. Um, and they created a community of people who could mm -hmm. reinforce each other's motivation and conviction that they were doing the right thing. And that's why it worked. So it's an amazing success story and it shows something that the uh, mafia judge uh, Falcone once said that the mafia is a social phenomenon. It has been created by humans and yeah. it will disappear one day. So it's not natural. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And this story also shows one element that, 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 that is fascinating for me in my research. It's this link between the normal business and the mafia. Because we mm -hmm. always naively believe mafia is something else. It's not connected to my world. But you find mafia in any kind of supply chain. Yes, like like you, like you said, they are uh, they have influ infiltrated lots of different industries, right? Like you don't realize uh, that in Napoli, for example, I like where I was there, I saw like what you were saying. I saw um, bur burned kiosks or gelaterias in the middle of the touristy areas mm -hmm. because it's not it's not for the loss financial loss more than show the others do not try to do anything uh, because you like you will be punished they infiltrated different uh, industries from food from uh more like scale scalable business of finance of course uh you mentioned as well uh, renewable energies that's that's just crazy like we said like people will still like, people will not care like normal cus uh, consumers uh We'll still buy those the mozzarella, right? If they if it tastes good, you may not mm -hmm. know how what's what's in that in there, but they will still keep, like they will keep doing it until someone decides to change their narrative and speaks to their values, right? Yes, and that that that's the point of how these seven young people made the change happen. They appealed to deep values of Sicily and they reinterpreted these values for these mm -hmm. shop owners, such as the value dignity. And dignity mm -hmm. suddenly meant that you do not engage in, in these interactions as you would never do this in another country like Germany or, or, or Switzerland. You yes. would just not do this. Um, and, and dignity is a, is a key value of, of Sicily. You don't want to lose your dignity. Um, mm -hmm. And to use the dignity value as a leverage to reinforce this engagement against the mafia was one of the key success elements of, of, of these young these young people mm -hmm. and and this goes beyond the the security and 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 dignity and like helping newcomers to to feel more know like free to 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 do something to 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 do business to to provide for their families but it's it's also about the social change and the hope for for new generations so i know that uh, adio pizza um were also i don't know if they, are, if they are still doing it but they were educating from the very beginning right they were going to schools they were they were trying to change show the kids that there is another way like you don't need to uh, agree to um to this and i know uh, like when i was in uh, salvador not uh, in in brazil uh, you know they have a big pr problem with crime and they there are lots of kids living in favela so they don't know any better but luckily there is this movement Olodum, <laughs> and which started as a musical i don't know if you've heard of it mm -mm. Uh, no okay so it was it started as a like musical uh drumming um band or organization and it, even michael jackson uh, portrayed them in one of their um 
uh, one of his clips, uh, they don't care about us. I don't know if you've heard of, uh, if you know it, it's like a long, long time ago. But the, the great thing was that it was through very simple social gathering and, and uh, doing music and doing something creative together, um, it spreads more to more than just music. It was also about the social movement, showing kids that you, know, you can do better. You you can uh, there are different opportunities. So lots of, of those kids um, could actually, if not fight against the the crime, then at least like do something else. I guess there are, there are two elements in what what you uh, explain that are important. It's this combination of community creation and storytelling. Mm -hmm. That makes change happen. Uh, it, the same for Adio Pizzo. It's also the same for any kind of big change in you know, climate change or think mm -hmm. about the slow, slow food movement in Italy, yeah. um, which, which brings back these connections to the roots of, of your local, your local food, your local memory, your, your local artisan craft. So it's always bringing people together who believe in a new vision of something so that yeah. they are not f alone in doing something differently than the others and, and walking together. That's super important. And then it can grow. Yeah. Yeah. And you mentioned that crime organizations, mafias, um, in many aspects, running their business, sim same or very similar, similarly to the legally um, created organizations. And, you know, we all have those, almost like romantized uh, visions, versions of what mafia is, like Padrone, uh, the Godfather, uh, Breaking Bad, Ozark. Uh, what else there was there? Uh, oh, yeah, I have some, yeah, Ar Narcos, of course. And and you see the, the coolness, you know, right? Like you want to, like the watching it, it's very entertaining. And, and they show you some aspects of, of making business. But I'm sure, like you know, since you've studied so much of it, what are the main differences and what are the, the main similarities between those two types of organizations? Well, partly it's, it's I almost say it's funny, but it's not funny. But the, the, the mafia also watch these movies and try to copy. Yeah. The and, they, and they, they call the Netflix. No, 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 you have to change it. <laughs> it's not correct, entirely correct. <laughs> so they, the, the mafias. The mafia's own symbolic world partly then has been uh, innovated by just watching these movies. But the mafia mm -hmm. today is something else. The mafia today means that uh, yeah, uh, padrone from a family in the south sends their children to Bocconi in Milano to study finance because yes. it's finance where they have to be. Or yeah. you, you create a company that is um, recycling waste because they know that this is a super profitable business if you just mm -hmm. take the waste and instead of recycling it you dump it somewhere mm -hmm. and companies pay a lot of money for the recycling so you you turn this into a business so they are entrepreneurs they um, they, they, they build these companies they manage the the flow of the money to switzerland uh, to swiss banks or banks in london so it's a very different world of the mafia mm -hmm. today it's no longer this business of drugs and and uh, protection money that it was uh, at the time of uh, the godfather it still is yeah. also that business but especially the uh, protection money it's more symbolic it's more it's not how they make money it's how they get rooted in their context to be protected um, and to get obedience um, but it's not about the money the money they make with toxic mm -hmm. waste with the power and and, and and they make it on the financial markets mm -hmm. yeah and i know that you travel um across and you advise lots of uh, different um, organizations across the world. Do you see any differences between how those organizations are formed and how do they um, are, um, like run, are run across different, um, let's say, maybe cultures? Well, organized crime are only investigated in Italy um, because mm -hmm. you have to know that culture well um, before you enter into dealing with it. I would never dare to work on Russian mafia because I know nothing about okay. Russia, so it's too dangerous. Yeah. So, but but a lot of aspects are very similar. So they all are very well connected to the financial markets. They all buy real estate in 
the same countries, they all invest in art. So all these money laundering mechanisms, they it's always the same, whether you are a Mexican drug cartel or an Italian mafia organization. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, and I remember you uh, you gave this example of the Chinese mafia operating on Italian grounds, faking Italian luxury products, and even the fact that they are building those factories next to the the, the legal the, the 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 original factories is like mind blowing. How how those mechanisms work? Well, it's a gray zone. It's not that you... We cannot imagine this as a big factory uh, somewhere uh, near Florence. So this is a is this little place called Prato next to mm-hmm. Florence where you have about 5,000 factories, Chinese factories with about 50,000 workers. And, and um, most of these factories to a certain degree are not legal. But mm-hmm. a factory can just be one room with uh, five sewing machines, right? So... and and. It, it, you don't have to have a lot of equipment and you can hide this. So if mm-hmm. when you walk when you walk through Prato, you don't see factories. You see, you see houses, you see a lot of Chinese signs in one quarter, but you don't see a lot of factory buildings. And the ones that you see are probably the ones that are uh, by and large uh, legally uh, embedded already. So it's, mm-hmm. it's a system where, yeah, it's the biggest fast fashion hub in Europe. But they also, as you mentioned, start to to work for the the, the, the important luxury brands to sew uh, bags for them or other stuff because they are good in what they do, partly. And they're, they're good artisans. Yeah. And it's all in this gray zone between legal and illegal. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But is it... I guess it is, <laughs> since they are doing it, but it's not very scalable, right? Like you have to create the same um, the same mechanism the same practices and distribute them so in a way you distribute the risk but it's maybe harder to manage but still they do it so it means it brings profit well it is it is easy to manage because if, if you are in fast fashion for instance you want to have your orders delivered as fast as possible Mm-hmm. And now imagine you can, instead of shipping that from China or Vietnam to Europe, you can have that done for a similar price in the middle of Europe. We just mm-hmm. give the order and a few days later it's on a truck and it's there. So uh, they are super flexible, they are mm-hmm. cheap, and they can deliver whatever you want. So, um, and they can, um, if necessary, work day and night. So it's, it's a huge advantage to be in Europe um, f- for fast fashion and that's why they're successful I guess it's crazy it's like they're just in time uh, taken to another level in a way it is yes it's just in time but I, I want to highlight one thing it, it, first of all it's not sweatshops so it's not that we can see there being people uh, abused and mm-hmm. exploited because it's Chinese who are there because they want one day to open their own little factory with five sewing machines mm-hmm. right? so they go through a phase where they work for someone else of course they're not insured most of the time um, right. it's not they work day and night so it's it's it don't make that much money uh, they have party to pay back for the traveling uh, in the in the, in the um, illegal entrance into the country so uh, it's it's a burdensome way but it's not that they're chained to a machine and slaves they they want to do the same later on on their own and then mm-hmm. again hire five chinese who come in and, and do the same so it's not a sweatshop. And it's it's also not a kind of Chinese illegal system in an otherwise well-functioning Italian context. I mean, they depend on lawyers, fiduciaries, um, owners of buildings who abuse them, who make them pay too much or who help them to right. uh, to, to uh, evade tax. Um, so it's, it, it's an entire system in which many people are involved and where it's not so clear who is the bad guy, who is the good guy. Maybe that's why it is so stable. Yeah, yes. And and um, actually, uh, talking about this, like we all know that, you know, bad guys do bad things, but you said it's more interesting to understand why good guys decide to do the bad things. And I yes. seen this, this movie, it was in German, I, uh, Das Experiment, that was a... Mm-hmm. Uh, um, 
English version as well. It was about the Stanford uh, experiment in prison, right? In 71, I think. Mm -hmm. Lots of things which initially were supposed to be good turned into something toxic. Yes. Can you talk about that? Well, it seems to be my my destiny to move into all these dark sides of business. So after the human rights violations and the organized crime, um, the third pillar of my research is on, as you said, good people doing bad things. So people who mm -hmm. are just leaders in organizations and suddenly get caught in a big scandal. Mm -hmm. And then we have mm -hmm. this tendency to argue, well, they, they are bad people. That's why they do these bad things. Um, but it's not so easy um, because in a lot of situations, it's people like you and me doing it. And then the question is why? Why are you and I potentially um, willing and able to do criminal things in organizations? Um, and the answer is not because you are a bad person or I am a bad person, but because there might be psychological factors that push you and me to the dark side. And the experiment that you mentioned, this Hollywood movie based on the real experiment of Philip Zimbardo, where he took young students and he put them in randomly assigned roles of prisoners and prison guards and wanted to observe them for two weeks of what would they do if they are getting mm -hmm. a uniform, others are sitting in a prison cell and what, what would happen? And they had to stop after seven days because it was out of control. The prisoners yeah. mentally collapsed and the prison guards became ever more sadistical. And this Hollywood movie is a, yes, yeah, a Hollywood version of this. Was, I guess even someone dies in the movie, but in the reality, no one Yeah, I, I watched the, the, the German, the Das Experiment. Yeah, Das Experiment was, with Moritz Bleib yeah. toy. So what, yeah. what you see is a very simple thing that, that uh, Zimbardo derives from his experiment. It's that context can be stronger than your morality, your reason. So the, it's the pressure of context that might transform people's behavior in a way that they do bad things and might not even understand that what they do is wrong. And this mm -hmm. is what I investigate when I look into corporate scandals. So what are these forces that distort the perception of people in a way that they engage in horrible things and might not even think that what they do is wrong? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I cannot understand that. <laughs> Being in technology and um, like I understand how much you can, like if you use technology right, you can see lots of things, you can predict lots of things. And we still keep seeing those examples like Theranos or even Facebook with Cambridge, uh, Cambridge uh, Analytica. And they are still fine, right? Like they just did the Senate uh, hearing. They did perfect PR. And they are still fine. People are still giving money. No advertisers uh, have, or maybe little, uh, stopped uh, engagements with with Facebook. And it's it's crazy. I know the 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 uh, founder of Theranos. She's starting on something new, and there are there are VCs uh, giving money to them to her. I know that it's some like you said. It's difficult to when you are inside the organization, and there are lots of factors playing on keeping you silent with also NDAs and some potentially uh, high and, and hard legal repercussions. But aren't there any ways or something which you've seen which worked or works, which you can use from the outside, maybe technology, just, just to see and spot early uh, any anomalies, any dark, um, let's say, patterns? Mm -hmm. First of all, I guess Elizabeth Holmes, the Theranos founder, I will have to wait a little bit before she can found something new because she's in prison for 11 years now. Um, at least one of the cases where someone was punished, there are not so many, because in most organizations, the managers who, who design these systems in which then their followers, their employees do the wrong things, they get away with it. Um, they're mm -hmm. not putting in, into prison. And it's the companies paying the fine. Um, yeah. So it, it's it's very easy to just continue because you have no risk yourself and you underestimate these dark sides in yourself. So you you will you will always look at these scandals from outside if you are manager in another company and think, well, it's bad what happens there, but I am not like this, so I will not do these mm -hmm. things. Whether you can measure this from outside, um, the, I guess we will see some exciting developments in re, in, in the next years about early warning signals for these things. Mm -hmm. It has, for instance, been shown in a, in a recent um, scientific research project that if you go to Glassdoor, so this website where um, employees can leave comments anonymously about their companies, 
Right. And if you go um, back in the comments left there on companies that later on had a scandal, you see in the use of words um, uh -huh. a change over time that signals that something is going in the wrong direction. Mm -hmm. So there's more frustration voice. There is more talk about aggressive, toxic culture um, incentives. So you, you see things in the words and the mm -hmm. words make it predictable of what's going on there. Someone mm -hmm. else has, has published a paper in which uh, they analyzed the language in the, in the research of Diederik Stapel, which is a, a Dutch psychologist who falsified data in 50 of his papers. He was a famous psychologist. Yeah, and yeah, all I his that. data was, 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 was crap. Um, and and wow. he destroyed his career with that. And what this paper that analyzes his papers uh, shows mm -hmm. is that the language he uses changes as well. So you can see from the wording in his articles um, that he moves into illegal practices slowly over mm -hmm. time. So mm -hmm. this is just one example, language, where you can figure out that something is going in the wrong direction. Um, there are other signals uh, that we might observe. If, if people think they are above the rules, when the lawyer of Elon Musk says Elon Musk sends rockets into space, he is not afraid of the regulator. That mm -hmm. says something about his behavior towards the rule of law. Similar phrases could can be found about the Uber um, founder Kalanick or further back in time, the Enron top manager. Yeah. So you, yeah. you can see from the wording of top managers that they believe that rules are not for them, they're for mm -hmm. others. And they can they bend them. The they, one, can, they can yeah. bend. They wouldn't see it as bending. They would say, they well, can lobby, they, lo lobby. They, they create a new world. And, yes. and Enron would say, we are a new economy and the rules are for the old economy. Trevor Kalanick mm -hmm. would say, the rules are for this old taxi business, but we are disrupting it. So we come with an entirely new game. And in this new game, there are different rules. So we're not breaking yeah. rules. We are recreating the system in which then yeah. other rules will count. So this is the hubris of, of leaders. And if you have this kind of discourse, um, mm -hmm. it makes it very easy to people inside of the organization to believe that they have the right to break rules. Yeah. It's, it's interesting that you mentioned um, that you can detect, you can spot those uh, shady uh, move, movements or shade, shady uh, behavior through language. And I'm wondering how technology, because it's difficult for a person to, to go through those um, comments, uh, you know, feedback uh, books and do it manually, but how technology can do it at scale. And right now with, with the whole development of um, algorithms and, and models around uh, human language, I guess it, it opens a new opportunity to to detect those to to maybe yeah like find the patterns and and do something about it in in time yes scholars who analyze these uh, uh, changes of wordings that pre made scandals predictable um, on glassdoor they used ai they didn't do this manually um, so this is from technology side is very easy the question is data privacy so i, I i'm sure that if you would right. follow the uh, emails of employees in a company, you could also mm -hmm. use that to see red flags um, appearing. Um, mm -hmm. But then you have to interfere with people's privacy and that's probably a, a trade-off we don't want to make. Yes. Yeah, so, so what do you think about the regulations uh, and like the aspect of ethical um, technology like AI? Have you, have you read any research? Have you read any interesting materials when you when you look into the big scandals of the last 20 years what you always mm -hmm. find is one key element is a failure of regulation mm -hmm. so a failure of regulation in the sense that we live in a world in which well, the, the dominating narrative is neoliberalism um, mm -hmm. which basically assumes that regulation is bad because it destroys the efficiency of markets so since the reagan government uh, in the USA, they have systematically dismantled regulation. Just take about, think about the Boeing story, where um, up to 97% of the Boeing crashes, the 737 MAX uh, that were, was badly yes, designed yes. and crashed, um, up to 97% of the, uh, of the uh, new airplane was certified by Boeing engineers who were 
uh, working dispatched to the FAA, the regulator, and the mm -hmm. regulator doesn't have the money to hire their own people. So it was outsourced to Boeing people to regulate themselves. Volkswagen, okay. the same. They did their own diesel emission tests and just delivered the data to the authorities. This is what we see. And, and then you can add the revolving door so that the person who does the regulation um, then moves into the company uh, mm -hmm. in a highly paid job and knows exactly how to go around these regulations. So it's not working. And if, if you take this now into the context of uh, new technologies, mm -hmm. you will see the same happening. And even worse, because there we are moving into a, a space where probably most of us do not even know what we need to regulate. We don't have the experience. We do not know yes. what is possible. We are running behind what's happening. So um, while in old industries, you know exactly what you have to regulate so that the car has low emissions or the airplane doesn't crash. We don't know what, what and how to regulate AI. It's, it's just emerging as a discussion. Mm -hmm. And then the same thing happens. The ones who have no interest in regulation, so the owners of these AI technologies, they divert attention and talk about nonsense like, we have to pay attention that AI doesn't um, rule the world one day. That's not the problem. Yeah. That's yeah. science fiction. The problem is them abusing technology. That has to be regulated. Um, and, and and if you try to regulate this in a context where deregulation is the ideology and regulation mm -hmm. is perceived as bad and all these regulators have no clue of what this industry is about, that's a challenge. Yes, it's, it's, it's terrifying. And I guess the, the one of the biggest challenges is that, like you said, it's a new field, but also there is so much of data and people who are trying to regulate it, like they don't even understand where to start, how to handle it. And I guess crime organizations who produce goods, uh, which are illegal, I guess one of the steps to at least hope to regulate them and, and spot them would be to uh, track the whole supply chain, right? So again, with the new technology such as blockchain, uh, maybe maybe there's some hope for, for doing that. Like they, the goods and the compartments are not coming from, from thin air, right? Like they, they have to be bought somehow. So if we can spot the movement of those goods, maybe there is a there is some positive outcome of it. I think it is it, it will be very helpful to track the entire um, paths of products across the supply chains with blockchain, whether it helps you to understand the production conditions behind that, uh, I'm not so sure. That's another. Because that's an entire different uh, discussion. So I might then understand this comes from factory XYZ, but mm -hmm. what's going on mm -hmm. in that factory still remains something that has to be either audited or the factory yes. has to be incentivized to treat people with dignity. Um, mm -hmm. And that is not visible in the supply, in the, in the blockchain. It's just visible how things move, which is maybe better for other kind of problems like uh, the waste problem. So as soon as you can trace the toxic waste, um, the mm -hmm. mafia can no longer just dump it somewhere because you can trace yeah. where it comes from. That is possible from a technological perspective today. There's just no intention to do so because no one wants to know where it ends. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And and are you familiar of any technology um, that mafia is is using? I don't know to you know tra track uh, competition to understand maybe some kind of to get some insights from what kind of types of business is performing best for them because if they run as a normal organization, normal, <laughs> then they. And, and they have educated uh, children who go back uh, to family-run business, then they definitely they, they should uh, look into utilizing those tools which can help them get the overall picture. Well, mafia organizations, are, um, they're always ahead when it comes to innovation because they, they know much better to move quickly than others can do. Um, mm -hmm bound by regulation and whatever. Um, so they're very strong in crypto currencies, right. for instance, yes. because crypto is a beautiful tool that you can use to shift money 
between people in a way that it becomes untraceable. Mm-hmm. So if you if you then then succeed in in hiding the entry spot of that money, um, then you can you can wash money with crypto in a very easy way, and no one can find you. Um, so that 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 is just one example. Um, the entire toxic waste business came up mm-hmm. when there was an earthquake in South Italy, and suddenly there was a construction uh, business that would bring them money. So they went into construction. And once they had construction, they had holes in the ground and trucks. They could move into top, into waste uh, recycling. So you see, whenever they have an opportunity, they're very mm-hmm. quickly understanding uh, what they can do with it. Um, and so I would expect the same for new technologies as we see in crypto already. You know, there, the, like you said, like the crypto and the black market and the dark web, they are all infiltrated by yes. the mafia. So... How can the good, good, good guys fight mafia with technology? <laughs> well, what you, what you have seen uh, recently is that uh, police forces across Europe have mm-hmm. uh, arrested a lot of people who were in networks that were organized on the dark net. So once you have an access to these networks. Mm-hmm. Then you have all the data suddenly, and you see the communication of people, and you you can you can yeah. trace it easily. Uh, you just need this one access point to enter into the communication that is done on the dark net. So there is a risk for the mafia that what all they try, whatever they try to hide, um, might be exposed. And when it is exposed, there's a lot that is exposed. So a lot of people get arrested. A lot of businesses are uh, dismantled, um, and that's what they have to live with with this risk. And then, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. but it's a, yeah, it's a race between the fo- police forces that are limited in what they can do and the mafia that is unlimited in what they can do. So it's um, a bit more difficult for the good I guys guess. to fight this fight. Yeah, but I guess if they unite with other forces, maybe. And it's it, that's an important point. It has to be internationally connected. Um, as long as the Swiss or the Germans or the French think mafia is the problem of the Italians. Um, mm they will not succeed in Europe to fight the mafia because it's not the problem of the Italians. The, ma- the, the money might be in Switzerland. The killer moves uh, to, to a pizzeria in Germany. We have seen these cases and hide yeah. there. Um, so if police forces are not equipped with technology and with expertise to fight the mafia, you can, um, be free. Uh, you can yeah. hide uh, as mafiosos yeah. so outside the country. So you can organize transnationally. Um, but the Italian police cannot act transnationally. Transnationally, they have to uh, weave these networks with other police forces. So that's that's a big challenge. Huh. Well, um, yes. So there is a good side of seeing the the the, the movement, right, and and understanding what each person and where are they and what they are doing. But also, it brings us to the the other side again. Uh, for example. China and the surveillance system and the social uh, score uh, system. Why do you think citizens, like normal people, allow it? Why don't they unite and, and try to overrule it? We don't have to go to China to discuss this question. We can ask ourselves, why do I allow Uber to store data about me as a customer um, mm-hmm. so that the next Uber driver knows exactly what kind of person I am? If, if you mm-hmm. are someone who is drunken and vomits into the Uber car, you don't get an Uber driver anymore because they know it. Right. Or we can ask, why do we accept that Amazon tracks its workers uh, with wristbands so that they know exactly how fast they move, whether they move the right way, whether they stand somewhere for five seconds to make a break. So it's it's total surveillance in, in, in our companies already. Yeah. Um, in some companies, it's emerging. The same for managers at, at Amazon. You are tracked in real time uh, how you perform. And if you mm-hmm. don't perform, you get fired. So every week there's these discussions about in teams, so why didn't you perform better last week? So we don't have to go to China. We don't have the integrated system where someone from above looks at all the data, but we have it fragmented um, about our our social media, about uh, mm-hmm. working in, in such companies, uh, using uh, Uber or whatever it is. It's a fragmented world of control 
but it's just a question of time until these sources might get connected and then you have the same that you have in China. So the question is, why do we accept that? Mm -hmm. And I guess maybe the, like, like what you said before, the someone, <laughs> some organizations, some people are trying to put um, the light on the, the big picture of China and how bad they are. So the things they are doing in their organizations, like with surveillance of, of um, employees, uh, don't seem so bad. Mm -hmm. And people, it's easier for people to accept that, although they should not. So uh, these are small things. So that's that's what makes it so dangerous. Um, mm -hmm. I use Amazon. I don't use Amazon, but if I would use Amazon, um, uh, Amazon knows from what I buy exactly what I should buy next. That's a big advantage. So they su there's surveillance uh, from Amazon, but it's I would say in a benign way. So I I like the fact that they propose. A book to me or a music or whatever it is yeah. because I know I will like it when I read it mm -hmm. I, I never heard about this book I buy it it's great because they know me yes um, so uh, maybe one of the reasons why we accept this is that it seems so so good to us it helps us in so many ways convenient and then it's convenient and, and then yeah step by step we accept it we we might have stumbled over the first cameras on a public space but now we have them everywhere, so we get used to it. We don't ask questions anymore because what we perceive as normal has shifted to something else mm -hmm. in slow steps. And that's, again, the same that happens in big scandals. If people making slow compromises on the rules, and then in these small steps, they move towards the dark side of the force. Um, surveillance does the same for us. So it's not never full-blown in your face. We would probably then refuse it. But if it comes mm -hmm. in small steps, in, in small doses with a lot of advantages, we accept it. Okay. The happier story. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I just saw on your um, your LinkedIn <laughs> when I was <laughs> surveilling you. <laughs> I was spying on your on your work. Uh, you posted like you posted and commented on this um, article um, uh, where the scientists are trying to understand the language of whales uh, through using use of AI. I, I guess in a way it's, it's amazing that technology can give us option to give voice to those who previously couldn't. And it may not be only the animals, but also people who lost their senses, right? Like there are uh, many cases where that there is a big um, success uh, towards regaining uh, some some of the ability to speak or see what, what what do you think about this maybe like let's talk about the whale example but like uh what do you think about the the whole idea of of ai or like new technology uh bringing voice of people things <laughs> which are um maybe different but they can still bring to the table I think what we what we need to keep in mind is that whenever information technology changes, mm -hmm. the entire societies change in all their dimensions, be it their values, how they're organized, um, what, what people think as normal, everything changes. Uh, everything changed when the, the, the Greek invented the alphabet mm -hmm. and suddenly could write as they spoke. Um, yeah. um, then the book print gave voice to people like you and me, normal people. Um, and AI and the internet is the third information technology revolution. And again, it will change everything for us. And change always means we lose something, we win something. So we are no longer able, as the Greek or the ancient Romans were able, to memorize tons of information by heart. Mm -hmm. Their brain was trained to do so. We don't need mm -hmm. this anymore. Why would we? So yes. our brain is liberated to do something else. So we could mm -hmm. start to think abstractly. Now with this new information technology, new opportunities come and we will lose again something. Um, what yeah. that will be, I mean, we are at the beginning of this, so it's very difficult to say, but we can dream a bit about what we can win. Um, what we win, for instance, is what you just mentioned, maybe the ability, uh, among others, to bring new voices into the discussion. If we just imagine we could use AI to give voices to animals or to understand their needs, to, understand, to hear their concerns 
um, mm-hmm. to translate what they think into our language um, and our language into theirs, um, that would change our entire perspective of the world. It would be a revolution of agency. So we would suddenly no longer consider nature as a kind of commodity, a resource we use, yes. but as full with agents with their own needs and interests and maybe their own symbolic world. So this mm-hmm. is one of the, the the things that I find exciting about these new technologies, apart from the surveillance stuff we just discussed. There are dark sides, there are bright sides. In any case, it's a disruptive moment, and that's very exciting. Maybe not so much for elderly people like me, but for the young generation, <laughs> it's super exciting. No, of course. Or maybe, I, I, and I really feel there there's a big, you know, there's a big movement of biohacking, and I I don't know if you've been following any of those uh, crazy people <laughs> considered crazy until it's done. Brian Johnson from the Blueprint Protocol. Have you heard of him? No. No. Yeah. So he's he, he was one of the um, also entrepreneurs. Uh, he he created I think Pay, uh, Braintree, which was sold to PayPal, eight hundred million uh, valuation, sold it, and now he's forty seven or something like that. And he, he put all his money into uh, regaining youth. So he, mm-hmm. he has like a team of, of researchers and, and doctors, lots of different machines in, at his home. Oh, and this guy. Following... I... This guy, yes, exactly. I this read guy. about him. <laughs> and I always and thought uh, it's a horrible life. but uh, It is a horrible life, but it's a, in a way like you need those kind of... You don't want to be the, them, but you don't want to be him, but you want to him to come up with something which you can maybe instill in your lifetime uh get inject i don't know um and and regain the youth uh, mm-hmm. people will pay for that there's certainly a market but what concerns me about all these new um thoughts is that it all fits into this new ideology called long termism which means mm-hmm. that entrepreneurs like peter thiel or, or elon yes. musk and others they believe that we have to design the world in a way that one day the human brain and the machine will fuse into yes. something new. So we will change into what Harari called homo deus. We will be a god, mm-hmm. eternal okay. life. So, uh, And to do this, we need to invest in two technologies. One is the, 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 the brain-machine interface. That's what they do. And the other thing is uh, rockets to leave this planet. Because if you think mm-hmm. with this far vision in a, in a few hundred million years this planet will be gone the sun will no longer warm us so we have to move so we have to invest in these two technologies and the which sounds so fascinating but the the dark side of this is that the conclusion they draw is let us not invest our efforts and energy into solving the problems of today's urgent mm-hmm. these few million that live today Screw them. We, we will be trillions mm-hmm. in the future. And that is what mm-hmm. we have to focus on. And this is what makes this theory so frightening. And it's the new kid in town in the, in the camp of ideologies. And it dominates the thinking in Silicon Valley today. And the entrepreneur that you just mentioned who tries to live forever, that's part of this game. True, 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 true. But wouldn't you want to live forever? No. There's this no. story of... Uh, of, uh, of of Swift, the inventor of Gulliver, he has also a story about people living forever, and it's a it's a nightmare. Sad life. story. <laughs> it's a sad story. <laughs> mm-hmm. Well, I saw this. Um, there was this. I, I guess it's it's based on some book. Forgive me, my ignorance, but uh, Sandman. Uh, there is a Netflix uh, series, and there is this. Um, his friend, he's an Englishman. So Sandman basically is a is a death, mm-hmm. and uh, he grants the wish of this to this Englishman of living to uh, living uh, forever. And they meet every century. So you sh- you see this person, uh, this this Englishman, uh, every few few episodes. How you know population how how the life changes and this the death is asking him are, are you still enjoying it aren't you bored and 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 the englishman is always saying no look how much like new things it's so so much exciting uh so i don't know i guess you know right now it, let's focus on living uh, our life uh, happily and uh, healthy and um, because when you don't have health it's like nothing else matters right 
And there's this uh, this important argument in philosophy that says that a lot of or maybe everything we do, all our innovative power, comes from the fear of death. Mm, true. Memento mori. Well, what what if we don't have that anymore? So will our innovation stop? Swift comes to such a conclusion in his, in his novel. So people just are bored to death. One could almost say they they're just bored. There's nothing happening anymore. No progress. It's just life is like a like a slow river. It's nothing special. Mm. So that's why I think it's maybe not so desirable to live forever. Yeah, I, I'm wondering, will it be <laughs> will it be this way? Will it be like people will procrastinate forever because they will have the manana the money? Yes, like time. Italians will take it to extreme. <laughs> no, <laughs> of course not. Not the North. <laughs> Terroni, <see. laughs> no, no, no. I, I love I love the whole Italian Italy. Uh, or will it be the the other way that people will feel okay, now we are dreaming, but will it be maybe people will try to feel Like they, they know they have much more time so they can try something new. If they fail, they will still still uh, do it again. I guess maybe, you know, part of this population will be the, the money, <laughs> the money lifestyle and the part of the population will be the other way. Like it's now. I guess it's ingrained in our human nature, maybe. I don't know. Maybe, yeah. maybe, maybe that, but maybe not. Because all these monuments that have been built by emperors and popes and... And then whoever built big memorials and cathedrals, they built this to be here forever, to leave something mm. behind. Yeah. But if I'm yeah, not going yeah. anywhere because I'm staying myself, well, I don't need to leave anything behind. So uh, people will see me. They don't need a substitute of me. So mm. maybe that's the point that I they made. Maybe the, if the fear of death is gone, innovation is gone as well because we just mm. procrastinate as long as we can. There's always mm. time. Yeah. Okay, but we are talking about not dying uh, biologically, but still, if a bus hits you, <laughs> you still die. Yeah, maybe not, because if I can upload my brain into a machine... That's um, something, yeah, that's something. There's, there's this dream of, of long-termism of, of Musk and, mm. and, and, and Zuckerberg and all the others. It's to disconnect the body from, from the brain, which, of course, is nonsense, because the, the whole body is part of the brain. But that's the dream. If, if my brain gets uploaded in the machine, I don't need that body anymore. So in this sense, it's a continuation of this hostility of the enlightenment of Descartes and others against the body, the flesh. And mm -hmm. We just have to focus on the spirit. Everything else is bad. Get rid of this complex body and load it into the machine and your thinking continues, so you are living forever. I don't think I want that, but that's that's the idea of Homo Deus. No, I, I don't I don't like this vision. <laughs> <laughs> no, I like to experience life <laughs> with my body. Uh, okay, you said once um, that fear only drives behavior when the threat is um, immediate. So, lots of people also mention uh, or they advocate for creating crises. A sense of, of crisis uh, otherwise people don't do anything about that but do we always have to put crisis or is there a way for the story storytelling to play part but to frame it nicely um, and maybe more positively than we, we are all going to die tomorrow well a few decades ago the, the a few sociologists um, Anthony Giddens and, and Ulrich Beck they coined a, a, a term for our time and they called our time the reflexive modernity. Reflexive modernity means we are the first time in human history where people can think about how they think. Mm. We couldn't do this before. So when, when there was a crisis, I don't know, in the Roman Empire or on the, on the, um, the Eastern Island, people yeah. didn't understand what was going wrong. So they couldn't figure it out. They couldn't find solutions because they couldn't think about the system as such. They couldn't go into a kind of helicopter view on their own society. They mm -hmm. didn't have the, the ability. We do have that. So we know exactly what's going wrong, right? We have climate change and we, we have uh, uh, the, 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 the bio side. We have everything analyzed. So we know what we are supposed to do. We know the solutions. 
Um, that's the first time in history. So I don't think that we have to wait for the catastrophe um, as others had to because they just didn't know what else to do. Um, mm -hmm. we, we can be more optimistic. And as you mentioned, one way out of this is to craft a story of the future where we want to go together. Mm -hmm. And that's what I meant with my uh, statement about fear. Um, if, if you tell people we are doomed, you might create fear, but, but that fear doesn't trigger behavior. And if mm -hmm. that fear is even abstract, far away fear, future generations, so why would I care? Because there's still time. Yes. And if I still have time, I can do something tomorrow, not today. So let me live my life today and maybe tomorrow I change or the day after tomorrow, but not now. So fear mm -hmm. is not a good motivator, neither in the long run nor in the short run. In the short run, it blocks me. In the long run, it makes me postpone stuff. So what we need is a positive story of where we want to go, um, a new narrative. And, and, and that is, I hope, something we can do consciously as societies. Um, we had to wait for that to randomly happen in the past. Um, and now we can do it consciously. And that's, that's uh, something that gives me hope. Hmm. On that positive note, what would you like? What would you advise to people, young young uh, professionals, entrepreneurs who try to change the status quo? Maybe um, build a company utilizing technology uh, to change the status quo and challenge um, maybe unethical practices. Do do better. Make the world a better place, as they say. <laughs> well. Climate scientists have, uh, like my colleague uh, Julia Steinberger in Lausanne, they have, they have analyzed exactly what we need to change in the developed world to stop the CO2 emissions. And there are two major drivers, the leverage that we can use. One is mobility and one is food. So mm -hmm. eating less meat and f not flying anymore, if we achieve that as individuals, we do already a lot to make mm -hmm. the change happen. On the other side, I, I would warn against loading everything on the individual because that's what the big fossil companies want us to do. They want yes. you and me to feel guilty uh, and then shrug our shoulders and say, well, what can I do? Not much. So uh, no one is doing anything. The real change must happen because we force the dirty businesses to be less dirty or to disappear. So that that is the real change we need to organize, uh, not you and me calculating our CO2 footprint. That's also important, um, but that's not what saves the planet. The planet will be saved if these industries get under control. And they're not right now. Yes, there is a lot to think about but, and lots to, <laughs> lots to do. Guido, è stato un grande piacere. <laughs> Anche a me, pleasure. grazie. Pleasure. grazie. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, and um, yes, I'm, I'm a big fan of your work and I will be. <laughs> Thank you. I will keep uh, spying on you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Gracias. That's why I'm on yeah. LinkedIn so that you can. Yes, I, I know. <laughs> and you're doing amazing. Like the, the things you, you publish. I will, <laughs> I will uh, do the link for others to, uh, to follow you. But uh, yeah. Thank you. Amazing. Oh, nice. and I forgot to ask, mm -hmm. how is Inferno doing? How is the, your book? Well, I have a, the big, the big mountain I had to cross was that I, I need an, an agent because I want to publish this in one of the big uh, publishing houses publishing. in New York, like Penguin or, or mm -hmm. Simon Schuster. And they don't speak with authors, so you need an agent who then oh, right. contacts Penguin or whoever. And I found okay. this agent during the summer, and now I'm writing the proposal that the agent will use to convince the publisher. So that's why I'm, I'm working on this proposal. <laughs> But the title Inferno is gone already. I agent, thought so because the, yeah, the agent like, said that if you want to sell to a mass market, understand. I know I, oh, those okay. ignorant. <laughs> <laughs> I will I will call one of the sub chapters uh, Inferno and uh, Perfect. tell the story, but the book will not be called Inferno anymore. That's, okay, I understood something the with <laughs> something with crisis and ethical. Well, the, ti the title we use now is Dark Pattern. Dark Pattern, yeah, so, catchy, still catchy, yeah. Good, good. Still prefer okay, so Inferno. Fingers crossed. Thank fingers you. crossed that you will everything be kept will work. updated on LinkedIn. <laughs> Ciao. Ciao. <laughs> Ciao.